Should, yeah. So should we roll? Yeah, let's roll. <laughs> oh, and we're live. Welcome Woo. back to another episode of Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at Two Bit Idiot, and that's Melton with police in the background, starting Wait, off right is, on cue, just is like that... Seinfeld. Oh yeah, shit, shit's, <laughs> shit's on fire just downtown, like, Ryan. Just like a New York sitcom would start. Um, that's right. Melton Demers, the chief strategy officer, chief investment officer. Which one is it these days? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for CoinShares, Meltem and I have a long history together. I'm the founding right. team at Digital Currency Group. Uh, both been in the industry for quite a long time by Bitcoin and, and crypto standards. There are probably a million different things uh, that we could start by talking about. For the five people that are going to listen to this podcast that do not already know who you are, Meltem, why don't we just start with the rabbit hole story? and uh, how we got to start working together and then ultimately your trajectory up through uh, through getting into coin shares yeah sure uh so bitcoin where to start uh 2013 oil and gas consultant spending most of my time on airplanes um working 100 hours a week as a young ambitious whippersnapper if you will um and was just really disillusioned by corporate life in corporate America and M&A in the energy industry at that time and was hanging out a lot on the internet as one does. I am a child of the internet. Um, my early teenage years were spent in chat rooms um, looking up cheat codes <laughs> for video games because I had no friends. Um, I moved to America when I was 10. I did not speak a word of English when I first moved to the States. And nobody in the small town in Michigan that I moved to thought I was cool. They thought I was weird. So I spent a lot of my time in my parents' basement playing video games, um, hanging out on weird chat rooms, and uh, talking to strangers on the internet. That's, I feel all like the I things, all of the things that you're generally not supposed to do. I, I want to pull on one one thread there. Do sure. you think that grow, uh, moving to America when you're 10 and not speaking the language? Um, how did that impact the way that you speak? Because I think most people listen to you talk and present in front of Congress and uh, just generally get on stage. And, you know, uh, charisma is one thing. That's why, you know, everyone loves having you speak. But you're also uh, insanely articulate. Um, Thank you for, for, for that compliment. A, for a non-native speaker um, and, and probably one of the more eloquent, uh, I think, that presents in the industry. How much of overcorrecting and being uh, extremely cognizant of having either an accent or not being a native speaker, do you, mm. do you credit your general speaking ability persona? Uh, how, how is that factored in, if at all? Yeah, so I think it factors in um, in two ways. So like I said, we moved to this small town in Michigan. I'd grown up in the Netherlands, but I grew up speaking two languages. So my parents are both Turkish. My whole family is still in Turkey, but I grew up in the Netherlands. So I grew up speaking Dutch and Turkish, and both of them were, quote unquote, my mother tongues, and I still speak both. Um, but then when I moved to the States, the way I learned English, we moved on the 4th of July. Um, and so school was not in session. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time at the public library reading books and reading has continued to be a really big part of my life and something I really enjoy um, and talk about and write about a lot. So I think the reading component, component uh, was a big part of it and really just appreciating how important it is to communicate effectively. I think also so being a consultant in the energy industry, as typically the youngest person in the room and the only woman in the room. Um, and so to that extent, one of the things I learned early on was in order to have my ideas heard, I had to try a lot of different ways of articulating the same thing because you never really knew what was going to resonate with people. And so a lot of um, what I did in my early days as a consultant was really think about different ways to communicate the same message so that it would resonate with a corporate executive, someone who's in the field or working on an oil rig. Um, someone who's in a different part of um, the business. I was doing a lot of international work as well. So when you're traveling a lot and spending a lot of time in different cultures, there are different ways of communicating. So you're constantly trying to figure out how to communicate effectively, which I think like Ryan, you've seen my psychotic emails and how I write emails like bullet points and bold words and a lot of structure. Um, 
I have just learned that communicating effectively across all mediums, whether that's making slides, whether that's writing highly organized emails, or um, t talking in a manner that's easy for people to follow, don't use a lot of big words, um, communicate ideas with structure, it's a lot of the same principles that really are informed by the fact that I read a lot and learned a lot from reading. And then second, I was in a lot of different environments where I was trying to communicate things that were not always easy to understand to a lot of different types of people. So you just start to develop these certain habits and then that habit gets reinforced when people react positively to what you're communicating. You know, I think communications in general is, is one of the most underrated skill sets that is in a uh, very short supply with, within the industry right now. And the advice that I always give to non-engineers that are getting into the field, particularly that are on the business side, marketing side, you know, software, software side, more or less, um, just start writing or start yeah. a podcast or, or start, you know, doing interviews or, or meetups, um, but basically just start doing something. Yeah. And on the one hand, that's the advice I give to everybody. On the other, everybody's got a newsletter, podcast, uh, yeah. you know, live stream, you know, these days. Okay, how, but how, here's, here's the thing about crypto, though. Okay, so this goes back to the origin story. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing about crypto, right? So 2013, you know, I'm in middle of nowhere in China working on a project on, like, manufacturing mining equipment. So bored, like a lot of work, but so bored out of my mind with what I've been doing for the last four years. Um, and I start reading about Bitcoin. My brother sent me this link about Bitcoin and I heard about it and I had like spent a little bit of time on Reddit. Um, but I really started learning more about Bitcoin. I was like, this is really weird. The people are really weird. These online chat groups are really weird. And you remember this because you were getting into crypto at this time. And I was like, there's a lot going on here. This subculture is very strange, very interesting. A lot of overlap, I would say, with like the early days of the internet, a lot of the weird subcommunities that developed there. And so, of course, I was hooked. I was like, this is great. These people are psychos. So <laughs> but more but it, it was like a it was like a giant um, cult of belief, and I think one of the mm -hmm. things I want to talk about today is cults of belief. And what was really cool about Bitcoin is it was a cult of belief that had aspects of um, economics and monetary philosophy and monetary policy. It had aspects of social philosophy, which I think is really interesting. It had elements of um, sort of this really strong ideology around sovereignty and uh, what it means to be a private citizen. So there were all of these really interesting like ideological themes that were getting played out in these Bitcoin chats and on Bitcoin talk and all these other forums where people were hanging out. And I think the second thing that was really interesting, one thing I think about a lot as an investor is reality distortion. And what I mean by that is I think all startups and all movements to some degree require, um, require a group of people to believe something unreal, mm -hmm. right? So five years ago when you and I started working at <laughs> Digital Currency Group, what we were doing- Elton is already teasing and laughing because we're not sure how much of this we're going to have to edit out. Anyway, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> but I think um, a lot of what we- we're talking about in those days, I mean, you remember the first time we had um, that event in Palo Alto at the Four Seasons, we brought together crypto land with VC land, with corporate land, and everyone was like, wait a minute, Bitcoin's not insane. These are actually real businesses that generate a lot of cash flow. Oh, that makes sense. But I think um, what's always interesting to me is people who, people who can create reality distortion fields and how strong that reality distortion field can be. And I think a great example is something like WeWork, right? WeWork created an incredible reality distortion field where, you know, whether it's Adam Newman or the investors he had or the whole venture ecosystem, we all collectively bought into this shared reality distortion that this was not a, a real estate or capital intensive business, but it, there, there was a tech play. And in hindsight, we all feel so silly because it was so obvious. But when you're living in that moment, there's this element of distortion or this element of suspending disbelief that's so critical to getting things off the ground. And I think in the early days and still now, like Bitcoin has that in so strongly. And I think whenever you see communities where people have this collective like reality dysmorphia, <laughs> where they believe in something that is improbable and insane. Tesla is another great example. Then it's a place I want to hang out because that's a place where a lot of money is going to get either made or lost. And honestly, it's also a place where a lot of fun and entertainment <laughs> is going to be had. So 
I'll hang so, out there. Yeah, so um, there's a difference between recognizing that reality distortion fields exist and picking the right ones that you're going to get behind, right? And at an early yeah. enough stage, right? So, so you you picked a, and the a direction, by the way, and the direction, sure. right? Right, the, the general trajectory, right? So we work, you know, on one one hand, um, 2017 ICO is probably in that bucket. Bitcoin 2013 probably in the better bucket. Tesla probably in the better bucket. Um, how did you make the decision to leap both feet into the industry in 2015 then? Yeah. After having some exposure to it in 2013 and then uh, having a, a couple of mutual friends where for the audience that doesn't know, Meltzer and I were almost classmates at MIT. We were. Um, you made the uh, better decision. <laughs> Maybe. I think, I, I think the, the, the winding uh, path has is, is generally led to the same outcome, but I don't think I would have. I think I would have been more of a misfit in a business school classroom for two years than, uh, than being in, uh, in Bitcoin two years earlier when it was real, uh, when, when it was pretty degenerate yeah. already. Well, and look, that's kind of what I felt, right? Um, so here you are, you're in business school at MIT. Um, and like everyone wanted to be a consultant or an iBanker mm -hmm. when I started in 2013. And then 2014, 2015, FinTech became a really big thing, um, especially in Boston. And I started working um, with this FinTech accelerator um, that's called FinTech Sandbox. Shout out to the Sandbox. Um, and a lot of what we were focused on were companies in the capital markets space around uh, data research, data provisioning. So we worked with companies like Kensho, Quantopian, um, et cetera, kind of that FinTech darlings wave of 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. And in that process, I started doing a lot more on the venture capital side, started looking at private equity. And as I started going out and talking to people, I remember this so clearly, right? It was March, 2015. I was graduating quote unquote in two months. Um, I was spending most of my time off campus or at the media lab, like not doing business school stuff really other than going out with, with friends and having fun, but not really going to business school stuff so much, spending a lot more time in different parts of the Boston kind of startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being like, what do I want to do with my life? Definitely not going back to be a consultant. Definitely not working in corporate America. It's not really a good fit. For, like I'm a weirdo. It mm -hmm. doesn't work well for me. Um, and then I started talking to venture firms and I was like, man, I don't really want to deal with this bullshit. Like, the whole political <laughs> venture firms are very political in nature. You know, most of them, there's not a lot of lateral upward movement. You typically come in, they hire two people for a role where there will be one promotion. You just like have to duke it out. I was like, you know, that sounds so not fun. Um, the great irony like, of venture capital is bureaucratic, homogeneous, and firmly entrenched. And I'm not a white dude. Like, yeah. so, you know, good luck with that. And at that time, I would say there was so little diversity in venture. It was actually astonishing. Like, I would go mm -hmm. for job interviews, and people thought I was flirting with them because I laughed at a joke. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I came from oil and gas. Venture was 30 times worse, which was really interesting. But I think wow. a lot's changed which is good to see. Um, so I was just looking around and I was like, I don't really want to do any of these things. I talked to a bunch of startups. I was like, maybe I should go work at a startup. I tried starting companies, not really feeling it. And then I was like, okay. My friend Dan Elitzer, um, who now runs IDEO's CoLab and IDEO's venture investing arm that invests in crypto startups, he and I were classmates and we started the MIT FinTech Club together. And um, I ran the MIT Entrepreneurship Club, super fun, like you do all the extracurricular things. Dan and I started, we'd been talking about Bitcoin and he was like, why don't you work in Bitcoin? And that's when he introduced me to Ryan Selkis, i.e. you. And that's uh, when I met through you, Barry. You and Barry put your heads together. You were DCG at the time. And you were like, she's not too bad. <laughs> I guess we can do something with her. Uh, so yeah. And I was like, okay. Well, out of all of the things I could do and all the things I'm excited about, this is fun. This is interesting. It's filled with weird people. I'm going to learn a lot. And even if I fail, like even if this is a total pipe dream and it never goes anywhere, at least it'll be really interesting. And so that really was the only mental calculus that went into it. It's like, okay, I could be small fish in a really big pond or I could go to a tiny pond and go figure it out. So that's what well, I did. The, the, yeah, I mean, the, the incredible thing about, um, you know, ha having you join DCG at the time that you did, it was basically this kind of operating company, kind of venture firm 
you know, wanted to be kind of like an index or Berkshire Hathaway for the industry. Yep. And the biggest open role that we had um, was this very ambiguous role of like head of community, right? Yeah. Which, which was, which, which is was like, a, and that thing, that the word community is like a mind hold trap on. in and of itself. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I know, I know. That was the role that was open. And that was the role that you came into and, and basically just created a new genre, I'd argue, in terms of pro providing connective tissue amongst the portfolio companies and, and broadening out the network uh, that DCG had. So can you talk a little bit about um, the, the role that you came into and then how it broadened and, and, and how I'd say that you were one of the kind of inventors of this category that now is very critical for every single open source protocol, right? There is a development network coordinator, you know, open yep. source liaison, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I agree that community probably sells it short and as a bit of a mind trap, but um, how did you think about the role when you first joined? And then, you know, based on what you learned, how did you kind of craft this, this new genre? Yeah, I think step one. So I remember um, I started at DCG before I graduated. And mm -hmm. so um, you know, there was a Google sheet that had a list of all of the companies that had been invested in, which at that point was 25 or 30. And um, my first order of business was like, let's go figure out what these companies do. Because I didn't know much about these companies. I knew a lot about Bitcoin, but I didn't know that much about the industry. I was like, okay, let me just go talk to these people and figure out what they're thinking about, what they're challenged by. And at that time, you have to remember, there weren't really any specialist firms that were investing in crypto companies. There was like DCG, Blockchain Capital, maybe Pantera. Um, it. it was a boost VC, right? But they were all two or three person operations. They were fairly small, didn't have a ton of resources. Um, Blockchain Capital, I think, was the only other one that would write follow on checks aside from DCG. Yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. And so what was really interesting, so I started talking to all these companies and I learned all of these things about what companies were struggling with. And some of them were really basic, like how to run a business 101 things. Some of them were specific to their business model, for example, getting banking licenses, keeping a bank account open. And then some of them were specific to the industry, like nobody understands this category in which I'm operating. Nobody will even take a call from me because you know, I have bit blocker chains somewhere in my company name. And so I started to think about and break down, okay, here are the issues that people are having at a company level, at the industry or sector level. And then here are the issues people are having because they're effectively orphans within the venture portfolios that they sit in. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as I started looking at that, I was like, okay, wait a minute, there are three things we need to do. Number one, we need to create basically a way um, to give these companies tools and resources so that they don't feel like orphans. And that's where the idea for the venture capital platform group came from. Um, there were a group of about four of us in New York at the time who shared the title of like head of platform or head of community at different investment firms. And so we would get together and have breakfast about once a month and we would you know, talk about all the challenges of our role. Now that community is 300 people online. We did our first summit in 2017. It now happens, I think, twice a year. People from firms all over the world participate in. It's super cool to see. Uh, so first is like, how do we help people not feel like orphans in a portfolio? The second, which you'll recall, was how do we actually legitimize these companies and give them a platform to talk to the broader world and the broader set of um, not just investors, but prospective corporate partners out there, um, governments, institutions, how do we just help them articulate what it is they do? And then the last one was, how do I become an expert on all of these different companies? And you'll remember, like, my brain's literally like a filing cabinet. You could give me the name of company. I could tell you everything about that company, A to Z, start to finish. And so it was really like, how do I become the expert? Mm -hmm on crypto startups, not just the ones in our portfolio, the ones outside our portfolio. So for you know my first two years in the role, all I did was go to meetups, meet with people, like literally anyone that would talk to me, I would go sit down with them and say, tell me what you do, tell me what you're thinking, tell me about this. And I was a complete idiot and I had no issues telling people, like I don't understand how that works, please explain it to me again. And people were really generous with their time um, and people start, are really generous with their time and I still know nothing, but like now I know more of nothing and I know that I know nothing, <laughs> so it works out. But that's really what I did. And then eventually that evolved into like, how do we actually use this to make money, grow our business, um, help exit these companies? And then I just started to morph and morph and morph and morph. Um, yeah. 
that's where it started. So being able to say that you know nothing is always generally a superpower. Being able to say it and have people believe, well, that's only about 25% true is like a whole other level to, to the superpower. And uh, one of the things that I think is daunting for people getting into the industry for the first time is the amount of jargon, yep. the <laughs> like insular nature, the, the, the online bickering and hostility. Um, all the reasons that we love crypto and Bitcoin, sure. right? All, it's all like... the reasons that are, it is so insanely intimidating to come into, right? Um, so, you know, the, I think that strategy definitely works, but... Uh, well, I don't know that it point. was a strategy, right? You make it sound like it was premeditated. I think it was like, let's just throw literally anything at the wall and see what mm -hmm. works. And there are a yep. lot of things that didn't work. Mm-hmm. A yeah, lot. so so I <laughs> don't lot. understand. So my point being, I don't understand this. Um, could be I just haven't taken the time to figure it out. I genuinely <laughs> do not understand this. Please help communicate it in a way that is not uh, in keeping with uh, PhD students, like yeah. dissertation, a very like esoteric topic. And then there's, I don't understand this. Are you sure this is what you're trying to do with your life? Because this makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. And that was where I think some projects were in 2015. There were certainly a lot of science projects in 2017 going back into that we work bucket of, you know, yes, you're trying to create a reality distortion field, but even though I might be a little slow on the uptake, uh, I, I don't have any idea what you're doing because this doesn't make any fucking sense. Or, or any well, but the reality of distortion I mean, field, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think a big part of that is a lot of what really offended me, like 2017 era, which is when like September, October, 2017, I sat down and I took a look at my life and I was like, what? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, absolutely not. Um, and I made was this some changes. When, was, was this when the potato fund was created? So the potato fund was created. It was January 4th, 2018. I remember exactly where I was. January 4th, 2018, I was on the phone with Joseph Weinberg from Paycase. Um, love Joseph, investor in that company, um, advisor to Shift Network, which is their identity protocol that they're building. Okay, so on the phone with Joe, 4 a.m., still in the office. Don't fucking ask me why. That was like another part of where I was like, no. Um, sitting there, and he and I were laughing at the fact that markets were going crazy. And he would name some random idea, like time travel. There's a, and I would find the coin for that. And then we left the logo. And then we'd be like, I'm going to buy some. Like just YOLO, right? So I took half a Bitcoin. So like 4 to 4.30, we're just like laughing, joking about the fact that all of this ridiculous stuff was in the market. And that it was probably going to pump, right? That was the thing that was so obscene about it. I was like, it is probably going to go bonkers. Uh, so 4.30 a.m. rolls around. I was like, you know what? We're already doing this. I'm going to take half a Bitcoin and I'm just going to deploy it into a bunch of random ass projects that have cute logos and really grandiose ideas. So Time New Bank, which is creating an accounting system for your time. Dragon Chain. I don't, I don't know what Dragon Chain does. Uh, Deep Brain Chain. That sounds cool. AI plus the blockchain plus um, quantum computing. Deep Brain Chain. DBC. Uh, so we just picked all these random coins. We were like, what sounds really grandiose, really esoteric, really cool. And uh, yeah, that was it. I was like, I'm just going to track these. And to me, it was an exercise in just highlighting how ridiculous things were at the time. And what's crazy about it is that there were people who were professionally, and I say professionally very loosely, but there were people who were professionally investing. Like this was what they did. Right. It's kind of like I laugh at people who are stock pickers for a living, um, not because I don't think it's an interesting profession, but like you look at technical analysis and the way that people analyze stocks, like I call it charts, lines and triangles, mm -hmm. right? It's this art of divining what's going to pump and what's not going to pump. Look, in a thinly traded market um, with only a handful of players, it's all manipulated. And so I think the act of being a coin picker is just such a funny thing to to try to sell because it's just the act of figuring out what's going to be manipulated and making sure you're on the inside of the manipulation, not on the outside. Yeah. So and it's so, almost one of those things where, where reputationally, if you're good at it, there's probably something that raises eyebrows, right? Right. Um, and look, a, a lot of it was club deals as well. I mean, you know this mm -hmm. as well as I do. And it happens, by the way, in venture 
all the time. This is how WeWorks and other companies like it happen, where um, they're a bunch of people who are investing. They all assume that the person they think is smarter than them has done the diligence. Who thinks the other person has done the diligence? So in fact, nobody's actually done the diligence. You have all of these credible uh, reputable people investing in it. And then you end up having this club deal where nobody actually really spent that much time on the diligence. The bigger thing is everyone assumes that the other people on the cap table will do the work. And this mm -hmm. is a big theme in venture. Like who on the cap table is going to do the work when shit hits the fan? Usually I'm that person. And that's really interesting to me. Um, but who on the cap table is going to do the work? And you have all these people who just assume, okay, if XYZ investor is in it, they've done the DD and they're going to do the work when shit hits the fan. And unfortunately, that's just not the way things have worked out. That's not always the way things work out. So it's just interesting to see how the market overall, like crypto market, broader venture market, and then macro market overall has finally figured out that like maybe people actually need to do work. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh so I think you've touched on two of the three attributes that most people, myself included, would look for in a good investor, right? Who's going to actually do the work and not just piggyback because there are other logos in the cap table? Who's going to be a, a connector? And you mentioned, and you do, uh, for those that haven't uh, met you outside of just maybe public appearances, have a file cabinet, you know, mind maze uh, that is <laughs> in, insane in terms of being able to track, not just track, uh, but then triage potential introductions or, or make, you know, lateral connections amongst different uh, firms or partners or, or the like. And then um, being able to not get caught up by the hype and not get sucked in everything and, and being able to suspend disbelief back a person or team or project that seems to have captured a legitimate reality distortion field that's worth getting behind and worth deluding yourself into believing versus yeah. just getting, you know, hoodwinked and, and, coming across as gullible and, and ultimately, sure. you know, a failed venture capital investor, which the good news well, and the bad news is you won't know if you're good or bad for like 10 years, but at least having a system, I'd say that those are the, the, the three things that you'd ultimately want to optimize for if you're actually applying long term. Well, and I think you want to, you want to stay sort of within what I always think about is like, I think about extremes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I never want to be in the camp where I think that everything I'm investing in or excited about is really amazing. Like I want to be skeptical and I think it's important mm -hmm. to be skeptical and I'm naturally a, a skeptic. So I have to often discipline myself to be less of a, a skeptic and suspend disbelief a bit more. Um, but then I think at the same time, if you are overly optimistic and you are constantly amped about things and you don't look at the facts of the situation, you don't think practically about building a sustainable business model, then you're going to be in the situation a lot of companies are in today where they have no recurring revenue. Their revenue run rate is like sub 1 million a year and they're trying to do a monster series A round at 8 to 10 million out of 50 to 60 million pre-money. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know what kind of crack you're smoking, but I want some because it must be real good. You know, so I think there is kind of this band you want to stay within where you can't veer too far outside of that sort of range. Um, yeah. And a lot of times I want to invest in things because I think they're super fucking cool, like mesh networking. I'm mm -hmm. obsessed with the idea of peer to peer connectivity. And I do believe that at some point in the future, peer to peer connectivity will be huge, will be massive. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And the reasons why have to do with hardware, um, proliferation of hardware and the difficulty of getting people to buy and use new hardware. They have to do with the fact that the protocols are really immature. They have to do with the fact that we don't even have like robust capital markets around data center capacity, right? And a lot of what this is, is creating the uh, operating systems and the financial tools to hedge um, production and to hedge access and capacity. It's like all of this stuff that has to exist for that version of reality to be possible doesn't exist yet. So I think it's okay to say, hey, I'm really excited about this and I believe someday it'll be huge, but I don't think we're at that inflection point yet. Similar thing with DeFi, right? I think DeFi is super interesting and there are a lot of really cool ideas. I think 90% of them are practically infeasible at this stage, which doesn't mean they're not really valuable experiments. They're just not venture backable companies because because there's no version of reality in which those companies reach a stage where they're commercially viable. Well, it's just not going to happen. 
Yeah, I think one thing that people don't recognize, you know, you think about the term crypto investor, and, and that in and of itself is a loaded term, but there sure. is some some merit in um, in being skeptical of those projects that you can invest in because other critical sectors just have not evolved to a far enough along state that the crypto project, crypto element is, is investable. So mesh networking, you know, maybe the constraints are on the hardware side. Um, there are other projects like decentralized media where a few years ago you'd hear about projects like Steam and uh, yeah. how many different iterations of decentralized namespace have there now been for, for you know, URLs um, sure. and uh, disintermediating icon. The, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of landmines that you can avoid if you have a little bit of awareness for where the bottlenecks are in legacy systems. And it strikes me that during the 2017 euphoria, all that went out the window because everybody more or less just became a flipper. Um, in a steadier yeah. state, how do you how do you do the work? How do you uh, come up with sector theses and then ultimately follow through on them on the venture side? And I <laughs> do want to make sure we get into coin shares proper um, yeah. in, in terms of how any deal flow that you might have or, or areas you're spending time with ultimately lead to um, opportunities throughout the rest of the business. Yeah. So, so look, I think when it comes to um, theses, so good point because I'm just about to hit published on my 2020 investment theses, like where I think value creation is going to happen. What has been a really strong um, sort of guiding principle. Is this going to be quarterly now? <clears throat> No. So this is um, investment theses on the venture investing side. The oh, okay. crypto trends report, I think we may actually do one over the summer, um, just because it'll, it'll be interesting to see where things are going into the halving. And I think there's going to be some interesting news that comes out in the in the next few months. It's going to really materially change the landscape, um, both good and bad. Oh, which is always exciting. So what I think is really, <laughs> what I think is always really interesting to think about um, is the idea of categories, right? So there's this interesting principle that you see in nature, that you see in systems, and you also see it in investing. And it's something called a power law. And what power laws state is that typically 80% um, or so roughly of the value accrue to the one entity that wins a particular category, right? That's the, the powerful entity. And what's actually interesting is we've had power laws in venture for a long time and in other types of investing. But if we look at the data, um, in category creation, meaning creating new category of businesses, creating a new category of business models, creating a new category of go-to-market, creating a new category of product, in categories, typically category kings, i.e. the leaders of a category, will capture 76% of the value of that category. So if we look at the data, it actually proves what venture capitalists have long sort of known to be the power law. Um, and so what I think is interesting, in a lot of places in crypto, we already have quote unquote category leaders, right? So if we look at um, exchanges, right, on and off ramps, arguably Coinbase is the category leader there. And there are a lot of others that are going to accrue value, but by and far the most value is going to accrue to Coinbase. If we look at um, new market structures, right, if we look at something like Binance, crypto to crypto exchange, where there is no in and out, it's just offering a huge breadth of products and services and the most listings and the most stuff, they're winning that category. Mm -hmm. And if we look at protocols, right, Bitcoin is the clear protocol category winner. Right now, if we look at it from a price of asset perspective, Bitcoin has roughly 70% dominance, right? And so there are all of these different ways that you start to see these power laws emerge. Now, what I always think about is I could invest in an established category and hope to identify someone who's going to capture a little bit of that category. Or I could go and find companies who are creating new categories, use my influence and my network and my, you know, writing and research to help um, substantiate that category and then position that company as the winner of that category. Now, both will get me good results as an investor, but the category creation and then the establishment and sort of positioning of companies as category leaders is by far the one that has the higher upside potential. And so that's what I've been focused on is figuring out, okay, what are new categories that are being created? How do we create an argument that those are actually investment categories? And then how do we position companies within that category? So take mesh networking right now, not really an investment thesis, but 
but I run a monthly mesh networking meets crypto meetup where we're exposing all of these different projects. I'm getting to meet a lot of people. I'm talking to a lot of other people in the peer to peer connectivity mesh networking space. And when the time comes, we'll have the capability to create that category and the subcategories within it and work with people who we think might be category winners. And by the way, what that means, like I'm not just talking to my portfolio companies, I'm talking to all of the companies out there and I'm constantly reaching out to people just wanting to understand, wanting to learn um, because things evolve very, very quickly. But I think from an investment thesis perspective, it's okay, let's look at an, ex an existing investment category, say it's infrastructure, right? Which I would categorize as on and off ramps and payments and transfers. In those areas, there are pre-existing categories that already have clear winners, and there are new categories that are getting created. For example, one category I'm really excited about looking for companies in this category is wallets that are aggregators, right? So instead of you procuring one service from one service provider, you have one wallet interface that aggregates all of this different stuff for you, mm -hmm. whether that's your existing crypto exposure, uh, your lending, your borrowing, it aggregates everything and gives it to you in a simple interface. And this has a great analog. This is what happened in the fintech space with stuff like personal capital and nerd wallet and mint.com. And so looking for the crypto analog of an aggregator um, is an interesting sort of approach, right? And arguably Argent right now is the best known example of that, but that space hasn't been clearly defined yet. It hasn't been clearly carved out yet. So if I find something there that I want to invest in, then I want to think about, okay, can I actually make this company a category winner? And there's a lot of calculus that goes into that. Sorry, that's and a long-winded answer. But. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's per perfect as a jumping off point because... Um, you know, what we, I mean, what you did at, at DCG was essentially build the network connectivity, right? And traditionally, the way that you've done that as a venture capital investor is you just write checks and then you build your network and, and your portfolio and, and try to basically just help them leverage each other as best you can. That's not necessarily the optimal model though, right? The optimal model is to sit on the sidelines, let some of these theses play out, understand all the players, put them all together before you hop into bed with any one team or company or project. And uh, if you've done it right in terms of network creation, you should be able to opportunistically invest as, you know, a co-lead or, or, you know, at least some sides will check in the category creator once it's a little bit clearer, but who is very good and, and who might be. But here's the interesting thing about um, what I learned at DCG that I think applies very much to, to CoinShares as well. Um, so the interesting thing is when you are a venture investor, the only way you really make money is you make cash on cash returns for your investor and that's when you get paid. And the hard part is a lot of venture investors have paper marks, but materializing paper marks into cash in a bank account, which is how you get paid is a very different thing, right? So for a lot of investors, you know, the first five to seven years of their fund are great because they're marking up round after round and on paper, they're doing really well, right? Their unrealized IRR or their internal rate of return is high, but their realized IRR is low, right? And ultimately at the end of the life of the fund, their TVPI or their total value created to paid in capital is going to be low, especially if you're accounting, you know, for the market we're living in now where the S&P does 20% a year, <laughs> you know, eh, not really clear if, if performance is there. Mm -hmm. um, especially given the opportunity costs and the time value of money, right? Yep. So then the question um, that I think becomes more interesting is how do you um, fit a venture investing strategy into a broader sort of um, play where you are an operating company, you have a bunch of different ways of making money. And so at CoinShares, we have a capital markets team where we have historically been prop, meaning we don't interact with external counterparties. We just trade our own book, but we're starting to change our capital markets offering and open it up to external partners. So what we do there is we do market making across a number of different markets. We, um, have a, a bunch of stuff we've built to help our trading team. We've built a bunch of different connectivity offerings and a bunch of different solutions for traders that we can now start to offer externally to the market. We have a cash lending book that we're working on expanding. And instead of working with just one or two counterparties who we lend cash to, we want to go directly to the people who want to borrow. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do in the capital market side where we start plugging our companies into what we're doing there. We start providing them with liquidity and connectivity. That's starts to get really interesting. 
Then on the asset management side, right, we're creating financial products. Uh, we have eight listed products in the European market. So what are the opportunities to create new listed products that we can bring to market for both retail and institutional investors? And then on the advisory side, we've got some really cool stuff planned on capital raising um, as well as Project M&A that we've been working on that we think is going to be really interesting and compelling for the market. And so I think, again, as you think about being an investor, there are all of these different hats you sort of wear. But at the end of the day, it's not just like nobody's a one trick pony anymore, right? If you look at the direction that venture is headed, there are basically only two ends of the spectrum where I think it makes sense. One is you're a mega firm. You have billions of dollars of AUM and you are uh, a powerhouse investor because of your AUM. You got in early before the venture model really existed and you helped create that category. So effectively, you're the category king of venture. And if you look at the firms there, it's like Sequoia, Andreessen, these firms that have been around for over a decade. They've had an opportunity to post returns and they've built their own unique special sauce. But by the way, like a lot of what goes into the secret sauce at these firms is corporate development. They have a whole army of people who are going out and finding customers for their companies, who are going out and finding potential acquirers, who are managing a lot of this connective tissue that most people don't think about, right? You just see Mark Andreessen on the screen, like delivering his talk there's a whole organization of hundreds of people who make that possible, right? They help create that magic. And then I think on the and, other- and they, were, and they were a pioneer in that regard, right? Oh yeah, uh, they absolutely and, were. Uh, I'd say, you know, DCG was certainly one of the early movers in that regard in, in building out network and having, yeah. um, you know, the, the role around you as, as prominent as it was. Um, I don't, want then, to, I don't want to interrupt the thread. So, so No, so but then where the up. model is moving to, right, and what we're seeing more of, like to, to be an effective in, investor and to help mm -hmm. companies today, there are three things you need. One is capital, two is influence, and three is a network, right? And what I think has been really interesting here, you look at someone like myself, right? I don't necessarily have a lot of capital to invest but I have influence and I have um, a network. You look at someone like Pomp, right? When Pomp came into the industry, he didn't have capital to invest, but he had influence, he built influence, and he started building network through his influence, and he got the capital piece on the back end by partnering up with someone who had capital but didn't have influence or network, right? So you find different ways to piece that together. What I think is so interesting about crypto is you have a bunch of people who've created wealth for themselves, who have capital, who now are starting to have influence and who are starting to have a fairly sizable network who can start to apply that capital in different ways. And so I think the really big challenge here is like we just saw the first Series A get done that didn't have a single institutional lead. It was all angel investors, mm -hmm. right? Which was pretty cool. $57 million round. And it was a bunch of angels, like over a hundred people on the cap table, I think. Um, we're working on a deal right now where I'm trying to do something a little bit similar where there isn't one massive institutional lead, but we have a group of people who bring their capital influence and network to the table because arguably capital is cheap, right? Money costs nothing. As we've learned from QE and what's happening in macro markets, money is fucking everywhere. $1.5 trillion of dry powder on the sidelines right now in PE and VC. There is a fuckload of money, like an absolute metric fuckload of money out there. Huge amounts. And the difference between a company that wins a category and a company that doesn't, a lot of times is not how much money you have. It's the people around the company who have influence and the people around that company who can connect it to a valuable network. Mm -hmm. So who's going to help you find your first customer? It's great if you can raise, you know, huge round of really favorable terms. But if none of those people on your cap table can help you find your first customer, help you hire that killer VP marketing, help you connect with two corporate partners who are going to help you with distribution, the amount of money you have doesn't make a difference. And so I think we're at the starting point of a huge change in how venture works, where we're seeing a lot of people look at angel funds, um, seed funds, scout funds, different models for how sourcing might work. But also mm -hmm. I think a lot of it goes back to category leadership and how you create and peddle influence, right? It's done on the internet. And if you're not spending time on the internet peddling influence, like, I don't know what you're doing in the investing space. Could, could not agree more. You know, I've, I've come at this from a couple different angles. You know, when, when I think about um, bringing it back to crypto, something like DAOs, um, yeah. I don't get excited about community allocation of capital. I get excited about community allocation of LP commitments. 
Yep. Right. So picking the stock pickers, right? P picking the people that have networks that have influence because the logos are not as important as the faces anymore. Yep. Um, and even when the logos are important, they're usually only important as like resume fodder for the, the faces that are now the new influencers and, and network. And what I think is so interesting, like one thing I've definitely started to notice is a lot of the deals I'm doing is like the same 10 people in the deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what you're starting to see in the crypto space is you're starting to see like when you and I started in crypto, Ryan, in 2015, it was one massive category. And now I feel like there's been these sub communities that have formed, like I'm by no means an expert in DeFi. I'm not hot on the pulse there because it's not a big part of my investment thesis at the moment, professionally, right? Like personally, hugely interesting, but there's a lot of stuff going on. I can only focus on so many things. So when I want to know something about DeFi, there are five people I'll go to. And they're the, in my view, the people who are best equipped on that. Privacy, spending a lot of time on it, by no means an expert. I have a list of five or 10 people who I go to, both inside and outside crypto. Cryptography, right, and applied cryptography. I have people I'll talk to who know way more about that than me, who I think are the influencers in that category. I'll go ask them questions about it. So I think the other piece is also constantly keeping a Rolodex in your mind of who you think is the smartest on different topics that you are not smart on and going and talking to them and testing the validity of your ideas. Cause I'll listen to someone explain something to me or I'll find a company and be like, this is so interesting, so cool. And then I'll go to six people who know that idea better than I do. And by the way, I'll also connect it to six people who've built businesses like that in a legacy space. And they'll tell me a million reasons why it will or it won't work, what the issues with the distribution model or the monetization model are. Right? So you're constantly testing your own thinking and talking to people who are smarter than you. And by the way, the way I find all of these people, Twitter. Amen. Like 90% I, I mean, Twitter. I think, <laughs> I think 90, well, I think 90% of the Masari team has been hired from Twitter. I mean, most of my professional relationships, they all start on Twitter. BD leads, um, you know, even folks that are interesting that I didn't, you know, uh, and, and this is the, the real shame of Twitter, that I, I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars per year I would pay for some enterprise subscription that could triage the gold mine of followers that you just don't even know about in many yeah. cases because they might just have like a, an egg um, and they're more passive and they're not pushing content out so much as absorbing it and but, but still could be you know highly valued. You know what I would pay a lot of money for is a messaging aggregator because I feel like I have oh, so iMessage, people. Telegram, yes. WhatsApp, like all of oh these different God. channels and it's so- there, There's literally 12 platforms. But the I, bad I thing is up, like- I mean, there's 12 platforms in a month. So but the, the hard part is like, where do you action things, right? So yes. I get all of this like fodder everywhere, but none of it is actionable unless it hits my inbox because I use my inbox as a to-do list, yep. which is why I delete a lot of emails because I'm like, I don't have to do anything, goodbye. Um, but like <laughs> there's no way to effectively action. And so what ends up happening in this age of like, ideas coming from everywhere is everything goes into this giant sieve and unless it funnels down into the one place where you're actioning is really hard which is why i think by the way a big trend of the next decade is going to be aggregation um, in different forms and we already see this like in financial services and we see it in messaging but it's very very uh, low low level and it's because things aren't interoperable um, but I think in the future is going to be hugely important because if it doesn't get into your final filter then it might as well basically like not exist so I think as we start to learn more about the ROI across these different platforms people are going to optimize for the places where they're going to maximize ROI and so you're going to see networks start to leak value because certain networks aren't good at creating value. And that just goes back to the whole crypto premise, right? Which is the networks that create and sustain value are the networks where people are going to spend time. Bitcoin has created a lot of value and sustained a lot of value. So a lot of people spend time on Bitcoin. And by the way, if you talk about Bitcoin, you get way more attention on social media because the Bitcoin network is much larger than the exactly. network for any one individual protocol. So like, I don't mm -hmm. think enough people think about how network effects compound across a lot of different um, sort of categories. So financial network value, um, social network value, and then BD and sort of monetization network value. And so starting to bring those together, like Bitcoin has done that the best so far. Will it always do that the best? Not sure, maybe not, but right now, you know, odds are looking good. And so I think again, just, I don't understand why people don't think about optimizing ROI. I see a lot of people spending time on things that are very low ROI in every sense of the word. And if it's low ROI and there's no way of scaling it, that's not going to work. I don't know. I mean, coin, coin shares is in many ways, I mean, I'd certainly, 
uh, we're, we're obviously an information aggregator and data aggregator, I'm sorry, but CoinShares is in many ways an aggregator as well, right? It's an, it's an aggregator of financial products for folks that are looking for exposure to this asset class uh, between yeah. the lending side, the cap market side, the ETPs. Advisory, yeah, the mm -hmm. ETPs. And look, by the way, we didn't do a good job of that internally. I think we spent a lot of the last six to 12 months like figuring out how do we want to go to market. And we've mm -hmm. realized being an aggregation point is the best play. Now the next step is how do we aggregate and how do we bundle in new ways? You know, if you told me, hey, go run, you know, an ETF company, I'd be like, mm, Mm -hmm. um, so we're is, your, is, is, is CoinShares close as comp DCG? Uh, probably. And I think the reason why is it's the business model that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there it's, uh, you know, without a cash cow business, which is asset management and trading, it's really hard to do all the other stuff, right? So effectively you have all of these lost leaders that bring people into the top of the funnel. And then what really makes the business tick is the thing that makes money consistently, but really is not, um, is not overly complicated. And by the way, the only thing that, the only reason the cash cow exists is because you have so much coming into the top of the funnel. So it's almost like the self-sustaining flywheel where yeah. the two parts of the machine need to coexist. And so what I'm constantly thinking about is how do I get more into the top of the funnel? And then how do we create more opportunities to leverage what comes in and turn it into dollars on our balance sheet and just keep that cycle spinning? which requires investing in companies ecosystem. It requires creating these new categories, requires putting out the research, like our mining research was effectively an effort to attempt to establish the cost of producing a Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a noble effort. Like how do you know what your COGS is, right? How do you know what the cost is? Or in the oil and gas industry would call this um, the lifting cost, right? What is the cost mm -hmm. of getting a barrel of oil out of the ground all the way through the process to where you're actually shipping a barrel of oil out of the refinery. So there's a lot of really well, fundamental it's, it's, questions we want to yeah, answer yeah. that make it possible for us to sell all these products and services. And by the way, it's not a zero sum game. We do a ton of stuff that will never make a dollar of money, but it's just important to do. And in our view is the right thing to do. Um, and mm -hmm. then there's also a lot of like, Hey, let's try something and see if it works. We did this DGLD, this digital gold token that we issued on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. It was like, Let's see if this works, and if so, we'll scale it, and if not, then we won't. There are, try stuff. There are a hundred other different conversation threads uh, we could have uh, and, and go off on a tangent, so may, maybe that could be a full-day conference uh, conversation like this. The, um, but I we'll have want... to do a virtual conference. Oh, it's already in the, it's already in the works. So <laughs> I did, uh, so, so going back to the DGEN thread, uh, Udi's uh, Bitcoin VR degenerates Oh, wait, uh, hold on, hold on. I, I have to pull up something that I think you you'll have. This the is a, no, no, this is a 2018 relic. Um, okay. This, this guy. There we go. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, we're, I, I can't wait for custom avatars. I'm, I'm all the way down the rabbit hole uh, with, with everything that's going on with the coronavirus, uh, obviously. And, and I think we're, it's going to be you know, more virtual conferences coming. But um, I know you have to hop uh, to another call. Why don't we uh, just end with a lightning round question because you teased it and it's going to be the one thing that everybody wants to know. What's the good news and the bad news that's coming out? What is in your crystal ball? Uh, that that you believe uh, is is on the horizon, uh, both good and bad for uh, for the industry in the next few months. Yeah, if people want to find out, they should follow me on Twitter at oh. meltdem <laughs> at melt underscore dem. Um, look, Selkis, preach it, live it, love it, like full full throttle on all fronts. I am patient zero, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, people, people uh, should tune in to find out. But look, at the end of the day, I think what's really interesting, like the world is a very interesting place. There's a lot happening, a lot of different fronts. Um, the madness we see in crypto is present in a bunch of other industries. We just don't see it because we're so far down this particular rabbit hole. But there, trust me, there are thousands of rabbit holes. I've been down probably 80% of them because I am a psychopath <laughs> and I have extreme OCD issues. So I spend a lot of time on very esoteric things that are very niche and really strange, just like Bitcoin. Um, 
Bitcoin has just had the pleasure of becoming mainstream, right? To go back to where we started, the reality distortion field around Bitcoin wasn't so far removed, but also Bitcoin benefited from a bunch of different macro events from existing in the time that it exists in, which is where we are today. So stocks, you know, stonks, if you will, over the last seven days have lost 10% now posting 4% gain today. Like nothing matters anymore because the world's fucking insane is my takeaway from that. Um, we're about to see massive amount of QE. Hong Kong has resorted to dropping helicopter money in people's uh, bank accounts, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, political tension, global economic recession, is it coming? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, political turmoil in every country in the world. Like We are living in some very, very interesting times. And then you layer on a global health crisis and a global pandemic. Who knows what's going to come out of that combination of ingredients? Mm -hmm. I have some thoughts on what's more probable versus less probable to happen. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Like, who knows? There's the great unknown unknown out there of like all of the shit that could go haywire that will completely change the outcomes of this experiment. And I think we continue to live in a world where um, the inputs to the experiment continue to change in very unpredictable ways. And the resulting outcomes are very interesting. Will this be in Melton's musings or is this going to be in your 2020 trends? Uh, this is going to be in Melton's musings. You know, it's been hard hitting the publish button on stuff. Um, I need to get better at that. I have like five posts queued up that I just haven't hit publish on. It's it's tough when you're perfectionist and and you expect that all of them are going to be be uh, be good. So I, I totally get what. Well, you're I have to from. filter myself also because I realize sometimes when yeah, I say things that I sound like, like a crazy person. Yeah, and there's like the whole political angle too. Who's going to get upset? And am I going to have to deal with this? Stuff? I've never cared about that. I think the the bigger question is, um, you know, we're a regulated asset manager. I just want to be very careful that what I say isn't potentially making me legally liable. Although nothing yeah. I say is ever investment advice. And I think I think the other thing just to think about like there are things that may be funny to you and I but mm -hmm. if we're trying to legitimize this industry and this asset class um, I just think sometimes taste goes out the window and we've seen mm -hmm. that in the last few weeks unfortunately um, so it's always important keep it fun keep it humorous keep it entertaining but also keep it tasteful and I think right now is just a time where we have to be exceptionally careful because I see things kind of crossing that line um, mm -hmm. between what's funny and what's distasteful so yeah. last question is another lightning round uh you have the luxury of operating both the u.s and uh in europe did you just call it a luxury it's in torture. some respects <laughs> i would imagine i am not envious of your travel schedule uh and not envious of the engagement that you have to do on multiple fronts from a regulatory perspective um but it is, uh, I'd imagine, interesting to see the difference between what's going on in the EU, UK, and, and, and yep. US. Which region in the West are you most uh, bullish on right now and, and throughout 2020 and, and the next couple of years? Uh, I think it's still the US for me. I think it's the biggest market. Look, at the end of the day, there's a lot happening in Europe. France and Germany are trying to embrace crypto. The UK, I don't know what they're doing because 5 AMLD makes no sense at all. And like, I think there's a lot of just confusion um, in the UK generally and in other parts of Western Europe. Uh, look, at the end of the day, the US is the largest capital market in the world. Has been, and in my view, for the near to midterm, it will be. Um, so in my view, like Europe is becoming less and less relevant. Uh, Switzerland's tried to carve out a niche for itself, but at the end of the day, you know, what we've seen is companies in Switzerland, people launching products in Switzerland, the uptake is just less than stellar. In my view, if you want to go gangbusters and build a massive company, the United States of America is still the best place to do that. And I think it's going to continue to be the best place to do that because at the end of the day, what I go back to is the medium doesn't change the message. It just Rewards. doesn't. Whether it's well, a token, whether it's a law, where do people want to be? They want to be where the opportunities are, and that's right here. I hope it remains that way, selfishly, as a New Might Yorker not. and someone in the U.S. We'll see. Uh, all depends on the election and our healthcare system and how prepared we are. Uh, but well, you, fight, you and the, the Selkis fam, you and your basketball team can uh, always pack up shop and <laughs> go, go abroad. If Malta ever becomes, um, you know, the next hub of capital markets, first of all, you know, slap me silly. It's going to be completely ridiculous. But second, uh, you can always pack up and move there. It's a great thing about humans. We're portable. Yeah, I'd prefer not to leave. Just out of sheer laziness. <laughs>
I like the city. I think I'll stay for a while. Sounds good. Right. Well, let's hope it's still here six weeks from now. By, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this is, this is going to be uh, like a time capsule that we release in a couple of weeks for this episode. And, and people are going to say, this was so brilliant. They were ready. <laughs> or they're going to be like, these people are idiots. And both would be correct. Yeah, both, both would be correct. Both would be correct. I embrace that. Thanks for having Melton, me on, Ryan. At Melt underscore Dem, C-I-O-C-S-O, all around hero at CoinShares. We'll see you again soon, Melton. And everybody, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, peace.